well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me and introducing me. Um, uh, in this, uh, under this rather grand title, um, I will, um, the, well, the title refers, is rather grand, but it refers to uh, Bourbaki, who referred to Euclid, and th they mark the, the, the end and the beginning of the paper age of formalization. And in this talk, I will um, expound on um, what the elements of mathematics um, mean in the digital age. So my main point is that we will that we are witnessing a, a quite a big cultural change actually in in mathematics, in which uh, proofs uh, currently are social constructs, and this is kind of a provocation, but it's not meant as such not directly meant as a, as a provocation, but it is often experienced as a provocation. But I think there is definitely truth in that, since probably none of us here uh, has really um, closely read and verified the four-color theorem, for example, or any other uh, really difficult mathematical result. So we trust that this is true, uh, since, we, since it has been approved by referees, it has been reviewed by people, by our peers, uh, whom we respect and whom we trust. And so we think that this is um, a valid theorem. Uh, this is exactly, this is a social mechanism for accepting the truth of something. And I think that this is um, in a, slowly, but um, um, securely uh, moving, this, this culture is changing into one in which proofs become fully formalized syntactical objects. Um, um, earlier, actually, already, absolute truth as an, as an ideal has eroded, and it will further erode, uh, actually, since, Go since Gödel, since we, we reduce the truth of our theorems to axioms, and we do not, we do believe, but we do not really, really know for sure that the axioms are, are consistent. We can, we do have consistency proofs, but they use essentially stronger systems, or at least different systems, and to prove those consistent, we need even more strong, stronger systems, and so on. So, absolute truth uh, was obviously an ideal in the, in the time of Euclid, but uh, not, uh, not anymore since, since Gödel. And, but it, there is a candidate to replace uh, absolute truth, and this candidate I would call full accountability, in which you make all the details of your mathematical result, uh, including the, the, the axioms that you use and the whole proof, uh, you make that public in the form of um, a formalized syntactic object. And then what, is the, what would be a suitable touchstone for this cultural change? Well, I would say that, uh, for me, a good a, a touchstone would be that a formal, formalized proof would be required for publication. That you cannot, simply cannot get a mathematical result accepted by a journal uh, if you do not accompany it with the formal proof. So the talk has two parts, and it depends a little bit on the time that I get, how, how far I come, so, but the parts are um, well, for part two can be skipped, and then part two is part one is still uh, one one whole talk. Uh, it's mainly since I'm always nervous about having enough material, and this talk was uh, scheduled as a somewhat lord, long, longer talk 
than I normally have, namely one and a half hour. So uh, the first part and the main part will be on formalization and the history of formalization and a new development on which Vladimir already has lectured. And the second part will be on uh, mathematical mistakes, actually, a taxonomy for mathematical mistakes, um, which mistakes can be detected by proof assistants, which cannot, uh, how are they detected, when are they detected, if they can be detected, and so on. Okay, so we start with the history, short history of formalizing mathematics. Uh, in one line here, the paper age, which is more or less well known, and everybody yeah, has heard about this in the, in the math uh, introductions, and so on. So, um, with the advent of computers, it became, of course, possible to mechanize all this. And uh, subsequently, there came a couple in, in here listed four, that are the four that I know. There may be others, but uh, I, well, I'm confident that those four are the most important. It started in uh, about 67 in Eindhoven uh, under de Bruin with his Automath project. And a little later, uh, Bob Constable in Cornell, he uh, developed Nupral. Even later, a little, well, that's actually not true, in 73, um, in Poland, um, Mizar was um, developed, um, and uh, shortly in the 90s, there was a project with the name QID, of which I cite the manifesto, since... Um, it was by far the, the most beautiful manifesto that, uh, of all projects, with uh, uh, typically geared at getting funding in the US. And uh, so they summarized this in one, in one good sentence, I think, which I just cite, um, namely that the aim of all those four projects is to build a computerized repository that rigorously represents all established mathematical knowledge. That is, in one sentence, the aim of all, the, uh, of all four projects here. Now, this particular Q QED project, despite of its beautiful manifesto, was the, uh, the shortest live of all of them. Uh, if you, um, you can, in my talk, if we uh, publish the PDF in some form, you can, um, all the blue, all text in blue are uh, clickable links. And here you see that they lived only three years. And if you uh, can read this small print, then they are now, their website is now hosted by the MISAR project. So that's a kind of funny detail. And the MISAR project, this is, uh, if you read about that, it is from the typical uh, East European tradition. Um, in this case, here they boast the number of theorems that they have in their repository, you see, and that is something that I associate with this report on how many tons of corn and how many tons of cokes have been harvested and so on and, and mined. So, so it is a typical, uh, but it is an interesting system. And um, Automat is uh, probably the closest to, um, current day type theory, and uh, Nupural is, um, it can, be, can be seen as um, extensional type theory, as a also type theory, but not intentional type theory, like Koch and, and so on, and other systems, but the extensional variant where type checking is indeed um, undecidable. We will come back to that. But before we come back to the technical details, um, I think uh, we should uh, talk also about, about justified skepticism, or uh, that one always has when, when one 
pre propose such a grand uh, endeavors. Um, this is one of the uh, one of the forms. Um, so that all of mathematics will be formalized, and that you cannot get a paper accepted. Um, that is, of course, a kind of grand prediction. And uh, so there have been many others uh, by Marx, for example, who um, predicted that uh, society would inevitably evolve towards communism. That was obviously a false grand prediction, I would say, although much of his economical theory is, uh, is still taught uh, at universities. And uh, so another one, Malthus was, uh, so that is uh, 1750 Malthus, the prediction that uh, mankind would uh, exhaust uh, the resources of the earth by um, uncontrolled population growth, I would say that we should not uh, think too soon that he was completely wrong. He, he may be right, but he was certainly wrong in his time frame. This, is, uh, this was 1750. So uh, with these grand predictions, they, they should come with a time frame. And so now for my touchstone that I formulated on the first slide, my time frame is um, uh, 45 years. So within 45 years, you um, will not be able to get a, a mathematical paper published if it's not accompanied by a formal proof. So, so why 45 years? Well, then I make sure that I'm long dead before I, <laughs> I can be proved wrong. This is... Uh, so that is the first... Um, um, form of skepticism. Another form of skepticism is that it is utterly uninteresting and therefore not done yet. This, is, this, this skepticism is um, found among uh, classical mathematicians. This is the classical mathematical objection against, against this project, this grand endeavor. And it is another, uh, another group of mathematicians um, maybe uh, because of some professional pride or a lot of optimism, optimism in, the, in the human mathematical mind, the states that's impossible. So, but the funny thing of those two skepticism is that they more or less exclude each other. So we, uh, we don't know which, uh, what we have to think about of this. Um, I would say, um, let's try and we will see, and we have seen that this is actually an interesting, uh, an interesting enterprise. The fourth skepticism is that uh, insights are more important than proofs. Well, that's actually, uh, I would actually maybe agree with that point, but it is, um, it is, it is not, uh, it is not an objection against formalization. Since if I admit that indeed insights are more important than proofs, then I would very much like to, to make sure that something is indeed an insight before it, I claim that this is more important than a proof, so to say. This is, and it is, by the way, it's something, it's something else. And I do not claim that informal presentations of the same mathematical results are so accompanied by formal proofs are become obsolete. Not, not at all. Not. So, um, the next, after the skepticism, uh, we can ask ourselves the question, why, why do we do this? Why, would it, why is it interesting to formalize mathematics? So that's countering at least the, the, the second form of skepticism, that it is utterly uninteresting. So, well... This is maybe not the best answer, but you could refer to people like Euclid, Leibniz, Frege, and so on. So they were, they were not stupid, they found this interesting. So, um, but of course, you need an extra argument. You cannot, uh, 
uh, even though we stand on the, on the shoulders of giants, we cannot, so to say, hide behind the backs of giants in such a case where we have to motivate our, uh, our subject. That I think one point is that um, it's rather, it would be rather a pity if our the claimed eternal truths would be founded actually on social construct. That is, so it is the, the very idea of formalization is, is, very, is, is an approximation of the ideal of absolute truth in mathematics. So if you still think that these mathematical theorems are eternal truths, then you should be dissatisfied with the status of affairs in which they um, are social constructs. Well, a big advantage, so the, probably the, the, the most important advantage of, um, I think, of formalization of mathematics is that it makes independent verification possible. So it does away with this social construct aspect. And of course, you need a computer for that and uh, a type checker, but um, it, it need not be somebody else's type checker. So the formalization should be such that you can check the proof with your own type checker. So otherwise, you would rely on the program correctness of somebody else's uh, type checker, so which is in, in a different form, again, a, a social construct. So you should be able to write your own type checker and check the... Uh, that might be difficult, by the way, but uh, run this proof and convince yourself that this is correct. And this will lead then to um, full accountability of um, mathematical results, um, where I make again this remark that informal informal expositions are not at all obsolete. So this, is, this has to do with the, as, the aspect of insight, understanding why something is true, which is, so to say, assumed to be explained by the proof. But if this proof is very large and a formal object, it is very hard to take such proofs as explanations why something, why the theorem is true. So you need some other explanation why this theorem is true. And such explanations are informal then and will not be, uh, will not be obsolete. Uh, verifying mathematical, formalized mathematical proofs will, um, uh, will um, uncover errors of various kinds in mathematical proofs. And in part two, we can we take a closer look at, uh, at such errors. It will also uncover a special type of uh, rather often, a rather frequent type of error, namely that of the hidden assumption in a theorem. And the classical example of the hidden assumption is the use of the axiom of choice. So that was... Uh, that was not discovered by formal verification, but one could say that it somehow was, was discovered by formalization in the paper age already. So, Well, another um, interesting and um, completely unexpected um, benefit of formalization is that some formal proofs actually yield executable code. And this is the celebrated Curry Howard correspondence between uh, propositions and types, and on and on the on the lower level, the the proofs and the and the programs, the terms. And we will see some examples on on later, some easy examples on later slides. So that is also if a benefit that you get by formalizing math, and it was completely unexpected. Equally unexpected is the interaction with computer science, with artificial intelligence, the, the interest of the, the, the mechanization of reasoning is actually, um, has been for quite some time an artificial intelligence subject. 
And another example of this interaction are the De Bruijn indices, which is the, the first, the first um, um, theoretically correct treatment of substitution under a binder. Before that, the, uh, before uh, De Bruijn and in the implementation before Algol, uh, this was uh, systematically wrong. Um, also in a uh, language uh, like, for example, Lisp, which is based on untyped lambda calculus, so in which, you see, substitution under binder is something which uh, occurs very often. And there it was in the early versions of Lisp, it was uh, incorrectly implemented. And um, they were aware of this, but they were not aware that this was incorrect. They were proud of this, and they called it dynamic scope. But later, um, it could be explained to them that um, this was actually um, not the right uh, way of dealing with substitution under binder, and they kept this dynamic scope into the language, and they added lexical scope. And the uh, first language which had the correct implementation of um, a substitution under, under a binary was Algol. OK, so uh, the previous slide is why we do this as all. So the, um, the, this slide is about why, why is it difficult? So why is this not a trivial affair, uh, which uh, for that reason has not been undertaken, since nobody uh, is interested in doing trivial things. Well, uh, the first point, I didn't know Vladimir's language, but this uh, talk, but this is actually the first point of Vladimir as well. And this is the, this is the difficult point, the diff is a difficult point of, of formalization, that is the design of a universal language in which it is possible to express all or at least um, a vast amount of interesting mathematics. That is really not trivial. And um, there is actually another requirement for that. It should be somehow feasible to write down this mathematics in some, in some practical sense. That is one thing. And so, but then you could say, well, um, now we have computers. Uh, it's easier to, um, for example, just write down the theorems and leave out the proofs, or le and leave, leave the proofs, finding the proofs to the computer. Uh, but that doesn't work for a, for a really fundamental reason that we know since Turing, namely that proof search is undecidable. So the, uh, the difficulty is that you, you cannot leave the, co the proofs to the computer. So um, we have to, the language uh, has to be able to express the proofs also as first class citizens. And then you can let the computer at least verify the proofs. And, but there is also a feasibility aspect that if your language is too expressive, then it might be too difficult for a computer to verify the proof. So that is um, so there is a trade-off between the expressivity of the expressivity of the language and the feasibility of proof checking. And this um, people were already aware of that from from the beginning, and uh, this is. Um, this aspect is called the De Bruijn factor, and the De Bruijn factor is the, uh, the ratio between the length, according to some measure, of the informal mathematical proof and the, and the formalized one. So this is, uh, in the time of De Bruijn, this was around uh, 20, so proof checking was actually fast, but writing proofs was horrible. So you, you, you had to reckon with um, a factor of twin 20. 
And that depends, of course, on how the informal text is, has been written. So um, if you come with powerful, more powerful um, uh, proof languages, then this factor becomes smaller. But what you actually do is uh, getting closer to the limit to which, uh, to which, uh, at which uh, filling in all the gaps for the computer becomes undecidable. And that limit is there since proof search is undecidable. But so the whole point of the design of, of this language is that it should be a good compromise between expressivity and the feasibility of type ch of proof uh, checking. Another difficulty um, with uh, designing in the design of this language is uh, that it should be easy to port results between um, different mathematical fields. So if you uh, have defined you're, you're done with piano arithmetic in your buildup of mathematics, and then you go over to uh, the uh, integers as classes of pairs, actually differences of two natural number, so pairs of natural numbers having the same difference, then you would like to have all your um, results on natural numbers available for the non-negative integers as well. Induction and all that. And that is not automatic. That is not automatic. It's exactly at that point that uh, univalence may help. So univalence is for several reasons, a very interesting axiom. And one of the reasons is that it allows to transport uh, be yeah, between um, equivalent types, and in this case, between the natural numbers and the non-negative integers. And after the non-negative integers, you get the, you get the same set of natural numbers as a, as a subset or subtype of the rational numbers and so on. So this is, this is pervasive. This is, uh, um, and it should not uh, lead to over and over, to the need of over and over duplicate the same uh, library of results on piano arithmetic. And Another obvious difficulty are the many uh, colloquialisms used in um, informal mathematical reasoning. So by symmetry, without loss of generality, by induction, etc., that is uh, that makes formalization hard since okay. So this was a non-exhaustive list of why it is difficult to design such a universal language for mathematics. Then um what indications are there that there is indeed a, uh, a cultural change happening? Um, on this, um, there are many links on this page, and uh, we have no time to to click on them. Uh, but um, so the first two are uh, popular scientific articles um, about formalization of mathematics. So the first two. And so that is, that is a sign of something is happening. If, if a popular scientific uh, journal uh, publishes such an article, there is some interest in this. They are very keen on that. And they find catchy titles like what in the name of Euclid is going on here. See, so that is, uh, that article uh, appeared in, in science, but it is behind the paywall. All other links I tried, so that, that will also work if your institution has paid a fee, but uh, um, only then. And all other, work, all other links are, uh, um, without subscriptions and so on. Another sign are that um, there are now three journals that I know of that actually operate the way I predicted. 
uh, it's, um, those three, you can inspect them. They are not yet uh, top journals in mathematics. They are probably outside the formalization community, viewed as rather obscure, maybe with the exception of the Journal of Formalized Reasoning, which came, grew out of the AI past of the, the AI past of the mechanization of reasoning. So that is, um, well, support for, uh, for my prediction. You don't get something published in formalized mathematics if you haven't formalized it clear enough. So uh, another sign of this change is that um, there are um, a couple of large formalization projects. Um, the, apart from the Automat uh, project that formalized a, a book on the foundations of mathematics by Landau, Landau's Grundlagen in Mathematik. So, but that is all relatively simple, and certainly is compared by um, the, the proof of the four-color theorem. And that has also a very interesting history, and was a, a real good test case for formalization, since that proof was uh, a social construct to the extent that it has not been so to say, it, it was not believed, the result was not accepted as such by a significant uh, number of mathematicians. So there it was vital to really, it is so complicated, it's vital to, to formalize and verify the proof, and that moreover led to um, better insight and a shorter proof and so on. And that was done by um, a team led by Gontier, and they published about this in the notices of the American Mathematical Society. So that is also a sign of a cha change that this journal is interested in, in this kind of verification, means that they are changing their minds on this slowly. Then the, another, big, um, uh, another big proof is the proof by Tom Hales of the Kepler conjecture, uh, sp uh, sphere packing, the most efficient way of um, packing spheres um, as dense as possible. So that, that was another proof where he had to wait for, I think, for seven years or a very long period, he submitted his proof to, uh, to a journal I don't know which one, but and then it 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 was under review for years and years and years. Hmm? Annals, of mathematics. Annals of mathematics. Thank you, Bas. Yes, and it was and it uh, came back. It was um, accepted, but there was a kind of uh, unpleasant for Hales, a very unpleasant uh, proviso in this. Um, in this acceptance, and this was also published, that the referees had not been able to, so this, this proof uh, made intense use of, uh, it was informally mechanized, it made intense use of a computer, and uh, the referees and the editors, they wrote a disclaimer that they could not, um, they, did, they took not responsibility for the correctness of that part that was uh, verified by the computer. So there, a formal verification also helped enormously um, uh, for the acceptance of, of this result. And uh, Hales wrote um, this book, published by the London Mathematical Society in 2012, and I think um, two years ago, two or three years ago, he uh, the, announced no, not so long ago, one or two years, the, the completion of the formal verification, this uh, proof was announced. Another big proof is that of the odd order theorem, um, again by Gontier and a team, and the announcement, you find it under the link. So those are 
clear signs that this uh, cultural change is underway. The last one, yes, I had one more point on this slide, is the Univalent Foundations uh, project by Vladimir, but he um, talked already about that. Okay, so now um, about the um, one particular way of formalizing proofs, namely based on type theory, so some <coughs> explication of um, of this, uh, we start with uh, we start by explaining the simply typed lambda calculus. So, in the simply typed lambda calculus, there are two syntactic categories: uh, types and terms, and they are both they uh, are in a double role. There are two possible interpretations of this syntactic object. So the types, they can be interpreted both as sets and as propositions. The terms can be interpreted both as elements and of proofs. And thereby, proofs are first-class citizens of this, of this formalism. That is, that is very important for the verification, since this language had to support uh, proofs as well. We cannot do without proof. Then there is a typing relation, um, in which um, one, some terms have a certain type. And this is expressed by this semicolon between a term and a type, and properly bracketed, but I will not write all brackets. Um, here is the first example. So uh, on the right, you, so T is here a type, and on the right, you find uh, something which is a typical simple type. It, it uses a type constructor by this, this, this arrow. So T arrow T is a, a simple type built from T with the arrow. And this arrow has also a double interpretation for um, the T interpreted as a set it means uh, the set of functions, in this case from T to T, and from T interpreted as a proposition, it means implication. Um, now, this term on the left is uh, a lambda expression, which is then also has two interpretations, with uh, T as the um, interpreted as a set, this is, so lambda abstraction is for forming functions from, from the expression after the dot. You abstract from a variable occurring in that, possibly occurring in that expression to form, to form a function. And under that interpretation, it is, of course, the identity function from T to T. Input X, output and it is returned in one. So um, under the um, interpretation as propositions, it is, the, um, it is an encoding of a constructive proof of that uh, T implies T. And in a constructive proof that um, T arrows T, you, you are given, um, you are given in it, an assumption um, saying that T is true, and you are then forced to come up with uh, evidence for uh, the conclusion of the implication. And in this case, that is very simple. That is T again. So you just return the evidence that you had for T. Uh, under that interpretation, terms of this type are actually all objects that constructively prove this. So here we have the two, um, the two interpretations. Um, a little more uh, interesting is maybe this type. Now we have T and T prime. 
And here we have a type which um, can be viewed in two different ways, either as a set of functions. So it's a set of function that for every element in T, it returns a function from T prime to T. And what, um, what function um, could you, so to say, uh, cook up that that is uh, given an element of t, you can, for example, return the constant function with that element. And that's actually what this term encodes. This term, given an input x, it returns this term, which is a function which assigns this x to any y, so which is constant, not depending on y. So this is uh, uh, also called the first projection. And with the other view, we, have, we can see this is also uh, easily recognized as a, as a tautology, a constructive tautology also, and of in particular. And uh, this can then be viewed, this term, as a proof of that uh, tautology. So now you, you're starting to see that proofs uh, can have some computational meaning, since with this uh, we have an identity function, not very interesting, but with this one, we get the first projection as a function. And you get this as a, actually by proving a constructive tautology. So we can uh, do that um, in a slightly more interesting uh, case, and then we stop since then it becomes too technical. Uh, here I have simplified in the sense um, that I do not give the types of the F and the G and the A. So therefore, um, well, we focus first on, on the types, since um, they are visible here, of course. And now the propositional view of this type is the transitivity of implication. And the... Um, if we view the arrow as um, constructing a function space, then um, we actually, um, well, it, this view is first maybe a little more complicated that for every function from A to B and a function from B to C, we can make a function from A to C. Well, how do we do that? And how do we, well, that is actually the same in the same way as proving the transitivity of implication. And if we now, um, at least in words, um, add the types of these variables, then this f has this type, the g has this type, and the little a has this type, a. And now, so given f and g and a, we should make an element of c. And how can we do that? Well, what can we do with an f from a to b and an a in a? We can apply this f to a to get something of type b. And that is what this term does. And if we have something of type b and we have a function from b to c, we can apply that function to f a to get something in c. That is what this term does. So. This term proves uh, this um, constructive tautology, but at the same time, this is an interesting term. And this, uh, so this was the first projection. This is a well-known term from functional programming, and it is the composition operator. So when this, this expression is just a composition of first f and then g. And so um, th those are the two, the two aspects, the two, the double roles of. Um. So that's the simply type lambda calculus. Now we um, we take one more step, and that step is actually that we uh, we become serious. We get serious about this capital T 
of which I had said, well, this is an arbitrary type, and you all accepted that for politeness. And, um, but we can press at least the acceptance of that one level higher by um, introducing um, a kind of supertype, which in type theory is called universe. So now we assume that we have a type denoted U, which is a universe, uh, containing types, maybe as a set, or as propositions. And with universes, we can, um, we can do cool things, um, since um, what we already saw here, this is a type, but this depends on this capital T. And if, if this is, for example, a variable, when well, we cannot do, in the simply typed lambda calculus, cannot do anything with this. But if we have universes, we can also abstract from the T. And that's actually a useful, again, for in two ways. That's called polymorphy. It is, um, here the lambda is again forming um, a term. And now this term is called the polymorphic, uh, the polymorphic identity. So it's uh, for every t, you can apply this term to a type, and then it returns the identity, fun the identity function for that type, which is useful in functional programming, since you don't have to, um, you don't have to write uh, an identity function for natural numbers, an identity function for lists, an identity function for booleans. You can have one polymorphic identity function and apply this to the data, to the data type to any data type to get an, um, uh, an identity function for that data type. Now, the identity function may not be the most interesting function, but the mechanism should be clear. This, is, this you can do for everything in which you can abstract. If you only can abstract from this type variable, then you, um, you can form such terms. And this is lambda abstraction to assign types to that kind of terms. We also, uh, oops, we um, we need uh, an extra, a new type forming primitive, which is called a pi, a pi type. So this is um, can also be read in two ways, as we will see. So, but for the moment, this is we leave this uh, just formal. But the well, the logical interpretation is for all t. T implies t, which is a uh, second order, which is a tautology in second order propositional logic. And under the set theoretic um, interpretation. This is a dependent function, and we will talk a bit more about that in a few points uh, later on this slide. It's a type of dependent functions. Um, so we have polymorphy, uh, or we can have polymorphy. Um, we uh, can also have so-called inductive types, um, such that we can um, define a type representing the natural numbers. We do that with rules like this. Zero is a natural number. And if something is a natural number, then its successor is also a natural number. So this is, these types come with an induction principle and uh, are, for that reason, called inductive types, and which, so to say, means that you can also get natural numbers as first-class citizens in your formalization. So now we had seen that uh, terms and types may depend on types, but we can also do that in another way. So um, we well, 
uh, we can also let types depend on terms, and that's also interesting. So um, you may consider a, a type P of X, um, which depends on a variable X, which maybe has the type of the natural numbers. For this to be well typed, this capital P should have the type N arrows U. And this is another thing that we, that we can do if we have universes. Uh, such, a, such a P is called a type family, since it is not, yeah, it is um, for every natural number X, it PX is a type. So this is actually a type, can be viewed as a type family where the family members are uh, P applied to natural numbers, indexed by natural numbers. And we can form um, the, the pi type in, in this way. Now, this type, as well as that one above there, have, they have a, a logical reading um, for all x, for px in np, px, yes, the, the first, so pi x in n, px. Um, so if px is a proposition, then this can be used to represent for all x in n, px. So under the logical interpretation, the, the type form of pi is, uh, represents the for all quantification. And with px set, the um, pi x in n p x represents a type of uh, dependent functions, namely an object of this type, let's call it f, can be applied to a natural number, and then the result has type p of that natural number. So the Domain is clear, the domain of such funct functions is always n, but the codomain may vary with the argument x, and such functions are called dependent functions. And so also we can extend this interpretation of types as sets also to, the, to include the pi constructor. Uh, another, uh, a further important um, type, inductive type, are the inductively defined um, identity types. Vladimir mentioned them already. So I will say later a little bit on that. And the expressive power of the system, if you add all those ingredients, then the um, expressive power is at least um, the, that of higher order predicate logic. So you get very powerful um, logic in the types, and also in the terms, you can speak about the proofs as first class citizens, and you can express uh, a lot of mathematics with um, the inductive types for natural numbers and for other inductive structures, lists, trees, and so on, pairs, so that you can form integers, and so on, and so forth. And the pioneers in this um, here are the Bruyne, Martin Leuve, and Girard, have, have been the Bruyne, Martin Leuve, and Girard. Okay, so, so far so good, but there a couple of essential problems with this approach. Um, so the first has already been mentioned. So this is uh, Vladimir's uh, substitutional equality, also called definitional equality. And um, a problem is that with a, a left recursive um, a left recursive um, definition of addition for natural numbers, you, um, this n plus 1 is not um, 
substitutionally equal to n, and that you see if you that is that still has a variable. If you abstract from that variable, you get to uh, functions that are will you normally you would like to be them to be equal, but they are they are not equal, not in a definitional sense. Then you can say, okay, my definition of plus is uh, wrong. I should have this right recursive. And with right recursive, this one is uh, this one is okay, since with the right recursive uh, addition, n plus zero is equal in the, in the strongest sense to n, substitutionally equal, definitionally equal, and after abstraction, that is preserved. And, but of course, that is a naive attempt, since then you have the problem on the other side. And either way, so if you on a shortcut, in the shortcut of your presentation, you just say this one, since then it is not possible, both, both left recursive and right recursive plus have a problem now. And also for the other type, for inductive um, equality, this is unprovable. So we see the phenomenon that in this formalism, distinct, distinct terms may denote the same function, where same is to be seen as extensionally the same. And if we try to um, incorporate that extensional view by um, for some, for, for all equalities mentioned in Vladimir's talk and my talk, so this is any of these equalities. So if you define two functions to be equal, uh, if they are pointwise equal for all arguments, then your, um, this equality becomes uh, undecidable and that then makes your type checking and um, everything that's based on that also undecidable. Question? Yes? You can certainly prove that however you define addition, you can prove that it's commutative. So even though it may not be substitutionally equal, you know, 0 plus n versus n plus 0, couldn't you find a member of the identity type? Well, that, well then the, you have... Okay, with extensional equality, yes. Yeah, with the axiom of extensionality, yes. Well, but even without extensionality, couldn't no. you get a member of the identity type because you can prove no, you, they're not substitutionally equal, but you can still prove. Yeah, but um, you don't you don't get it. No, it is. Uh, you don't get this. This is not provable. There exist models in which they are different. The close the closed term model, for example. of a proof of equality is reflexivity. Yeah. It's the only canonical constructor. Yeah. So, so you can only prove two things to be equal without assumptions which are actually convertible. In the empty context, yes. if you have a definition of, of, of equality, then you have a certain amount of axioms. Are you telling me you can't prove that addition is commutative? I can prove that addition is commutative, but I cannot prove that these two functions yeah. are equal. Exactly. Yeah. You cannot go under the lambda abstraction. Yeah. I mean, you could prove 0 plus n equals n yeah. plus 0, mm, yes. but not lambda n. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is not without the axiom of extensionality. So in, in models in which the axiom of extensionality is not satisfied, you cannot prove this. Now we can later um, talk about how, you see this is um, how big or not so big is this disadvantage. This is, uh, well we can do it here. So what I said at proof search, this is, this is uh, I think up to now, I think it's kind of, uh, it's uh, the, um, there's very little of my opinion in, in what I present. 
I think this is generally accepted. What I'm going to say on this point that is, is more an opinion than a fact. So that I should be um, explicit about that. So um, now, how bad is it that um, type checking becomes undecidable? Then for, for me, if you go back to why we do this, we would actually leave proof search to the, to the computer. So that we, we, we develop our mathematics in a language where we formulate the theorems only, and we leave proof search to the computer. It's optimistic. Uh, in, in propositional logic, that is already a, a big problem. But um, we, we talk in principle about... Um, so that is, that is then, in principle, not possible. Not only that there are some practical problems, uh, but it is undecidable whether a sentence in predicate logic and in much weaker, weaker logics um, is a tautology or not. So now instead of proof search, we go to, we, we give the computer, we go to proof verification. So we capitulate completely, but this is inevitable, and we give the computer the proof, the whole proof, and the and, and, and the, the task of the computer is checking, checking this proof. And so for me, it is then quite natural. So there may be practical problems with large proofs, but it is quite natural to require that proof checking is decidable. Since if we let elements in our... We, we incorporate elements in our type theory. We make it so strong that also type checking becomes undecidable. There is, there is no reduction in, from proof search to proof verification. So then we should not only give the proof, tell the, the computer the whole proof, but we should, should also tell the computer how to verify the proof, since type checking is, is undecidable if you have things like this. And then there is no end, of course. Then you can, that could be repeated in principle. So the, my, my argument in favor of decidability of type checking is that, that that draws a line under that process of reduction. But Andrew may disagree. If you only wanted to have function extensionality on the propositional level, then you would leave. Yeah, yeah, then it's still fine. Yeah. Then it's okay. Yeah. And then you wouldn't expect yeah. to, to prove yeah. every true proposition. Yeah. So, so a, a compromise would be extensionality that 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 Bob used implicitly in his uh, in his remark. Uh, that axiom that you just add that as a standard axiom to your type theory. That, is, that keeps um, type checking decidable, but then you lose canonicity, you lose a couple of other things that, uh, that you um, might like to preserve. But we can talk about that later, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, this, uh, this phenomenon is not only um, does not only regard um, functions, but it so that the, the phenomenon that I uh, um, exemplify here is that you may have um, distinct terms denoting the same function, distinct terms that actually denote the same thing extensionally, you would like to identify them. This, this can happen also since uh, types can depend on terms, so then it can happen with types as well. Um, it is actually um, the case that even more loose identifications, so not, not only those with that problem, but um, for example, natural numbers and non-negative integers that you would like to identify them or lists over a singleton. So that is the 
the, the good thing about the univalence axiom that that becomes possible under the univalence axiom. The, the, that, so that's the good news. The bad news is that the univalence axiom then has all the disadvantages of, for example, the extensionality axiom that you would add to um, uh, type theory. But, okay, there, uh, we are working on solutions, so to say, for that. Um, Okay, so then, before I can talk about Julie Vale's axiom, I would like to say a few uh, informal words about homotopy type theory. Um, so, um, so as the name suggests, this um, this is an interpretation of type theory, which depends on homotopy theory. And in homotopy theory, we consider topological spaces modulo homotopy equivalence. Now, the, f the next three points are actually Vladimir's uh, explanation that I picked up during a talk, and which, in particular, last point I like very much. So he, he says geometry is about shape. And topology is about the essence of shape. And homotopy <laughs> is uh, about the essence of the essence of shape. So homotopy theory is about continuous uh, deformations of, well, of um, topological spaces or topological objects, functions, paths, and so on. So, um, so homotopy is a um, continuous map with a continuous quasi-inverse, and that makes that, um, since this quasi-inverse need not be bijective, that um, you can identify much more with much more uh, topological things, so to say, spaces, functions, so on, are homotopy equivalent, then there are homeomorphic, in which case you require the inverse, uh, the, 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 the continuous map to be um, bijective and continuous, having a continuous inverse. Then, um, under this homotopy, theory interpretation, uh, types, they get a third interpretation after propositions and sets. Now, also um, topological spaces, or maybe a little more precise as homotopy types of topological spaces. Uh, terms get um, also a third, accordingly, a third interpretation namely as points in a topological space of the type, then. And the identity types, they uh, get, and that is actually the, the miracle of this, uh, the miracle of this interpretation is that the recur inductively defined um, identity types, so propositional equality, they, um, they get a very natural interpretation under this inter as path spaces in homotopy theory. And then we have this book on, on that if you want to read more. Now, um, with, in this setup, um, we can... Um, informally formulate the univalence axiom, or explain, let me, see. yeah, explain the, un so first we should uh, explain the universe, the universe of types becomes now a um, topological space of, topolo of topological spaces. That, is, that should be with, with particular properties. If, uh, if the universe is to be univalent, then this is a very specific topological space of topological spaces. 
or must be a very specific space, topological space of topological spaces. And then um, the univalence axiom um, states roughly that homotopy equivalent types in U can be, can be identified. And that has several consequences. Um, one of them is function extension, extensionality. Um, also, for example, that the natural numbers and the non-negative integers, they can be identified. And this is then a equality which is um, called by Vladimir transportationally, tra transportational, the adjective. And that means that we can transport structure and uh, properties and lemmas and theorems and so on. We can transport them along the path in the universe from, for example, n to the non-negative integers. So, and that is then achieving one of the requirements of, uh, of a formalization, namely that it, you, it would not uh, lead to uncontrolled duplication of um, libraries. Uh, that the price to be paid is, of course, this transportation, which is not completely trivial. Well, can be identified, that is exactly, that is this uh, transportation, Leibniz equality, and that, that um, Vladimir explained. Uh, so, back to possible criticism uh, against a, a possible objection against this approach, homotopy type theory, why, why can't we do that in zermelo frankel um, set theory? This is, why, is this, why is this so uh, unique for type theory with univalence? Well, um, look at those uh, two ways of defining the natural numbers in the um, encoding natural numbers in ZF. So in both encodings, zero is um, represented by the empty set. And in the von Neumann encoding of natural numbers, we uh, let this set, so the set representing N um, union, the singleton set with one element N, represent the natural number n plus 1. And an alternative way, I think this one was Vladimir's uh, example on the, on the, on the blackboard. Uh, I think that's the Kuratowski in the natural numbers. I don't, I don't re recall who, who came up with this encoding. The? Zermelo himself. Zermelo, very good, thank you. Zermelo himself. Yeah. And they lead to different... Uh, so if you uh, expand the two, the two definitions, then the first one, so they both, they both um, start here. Then uh, von Neumann continues with one equals this one. And Zermelo continues with one prime equal this same one. So now um, von Neumann continues with two equals one union one. So this is the union of, so we first have one and then we have the singleton set one. So that is this one here. And here, uh, life is a little simpler. 
So let's write them under each other here. This is just this one. So you have those two. And now the, the point is that um, in ZF, we can, in the language of ZF, it is perfectly fine to uh, formulate a sentence like zero is an element of two. So, um, zero is an element of two, which is um, true. This, this one was zero which is true for the von Neumann. So true for von Neumann. But for Zermelo, it's false. So zero into prime is false for Zermelo. So the Language of ZF um, makes it possible to distinguish between two different encodings of the natural numbers. Which means that if you were to port results on one, on, on one sort of natural numbers to the other sort of natural numbers, you must be very careful about the specific formulation, the specific language in which you formulate the result. Since if that language, that language should exclude such simple things as this, as this one. And um, now what is the, um, the point? Why is univalence axioms true in, in, in tight theory? That is that uh, in Thai theory, with um, you, the the language is such that you cannot formulate the you cannot formulate something which distinguishes between uh, two homotopy equivalent things, and that is and that is why the univalence axiom that so that is can be consistently added to Thai theory. So it tells something very positive. Well, I think basically, but that is more opinion than fact. The, since then, I, I take a position, uh, so to say, in between the discussion between ZF, between set theory and type theory, it is very positive that the language of type theory cannot distinguish. Since then, you can consistently add univalence axiom and use that and which comes with all the benefits that univalence um, gives you, function, extensionality, and so on. But other people would say that it is a weakness of the language. That it is you work in a language and you, so to say, your, your, your hands are tied on the back. So there's very much, um, there's a discussion, I'm on the type theory side, but which... Uh, somehow reminds me of the discussion between um, strongly typed uh, programming languages and weakly typed programming languages. So in the strongly typed language, the language forbids uh, the programmer to make certain mistakes. But it also forbids something, some constructions that the programmer himself actually thinks that it's very clever and a uh, good use of the weak type system. And then those are the people then that would be on the, on the ZF side. You see in ZF you have with these encodings and you can um, basically um, express much more. So you can, in the view of people on the type theory, side, you, you can express things that you should not wish to express at all in the first place. <laughs> oh.
Okay, here are my conclusions. Um, so, my main point is this cultural trend, see, which towards ever more formal presentation that is since Euclid and now mechanized, but uh, at least to counter a familiar objection is that, um, in my view, this only concerns one form of the presentation of mathematics. So it is uh, certainly not in any way restraining the uh, creative process of invention of mathematics. So you don't, you, I, I don't, this is, this is uh, for example, Polia in his book, uh, Proofs and Reputations, he, he, so to say, sets up a straw man against formalization since he comes with a, so with all kinds of valid examples, justified examples of that the, the whole process of invention has, uh, very little to do with formalization. For example, the development of the, of the definition of the polyhedron to, uh, as to satisfy the Euler formula is, uh, is one of proofs and refutations of false proofs, see, and not, uh, not, not formal. So the creative process is, is completely free. Then homody homotopy type theory addresses some essential problems and uh, univalence is a new axiom about equality and it could help. It is. And uh, as, uh, so to say, we will, have, um, we will have a panel discussion as well. Yes, I think that uh, um, this is uh, an obvious point for discussion that um, a modern foundation of mathematics must be usable. So the, I, have, um, I have said many things which pertain to the usability of the foundation for um, mechanized verification and so on. So this is, um, and then it should, we should keep in mind that the um, other approaches that I think that is also another argument for the ZF people and the other approaches actually have uh, never been designed for actual use. They have, they are, well, ZF has probably started to, to study the infinite, but, and after that only for and, and the same is true for actually for natural deduction and sequent calculus, only for metamathematical meta study. Never, never, ever for the actual use. Only for that you could, in principle, do it if you have enough resources, time, and uh, memory space, and so on. But never to really do it. And I think for homotopy type theory, the idea is to really do it. <laughs>